It's been a while since we had a video and I know that we haven't gotten to talk about a lot of hands recently and last video I talked about basically breaking everything on the summer, breaking 15 events in a row. Well, 15 bullets, they weren't all in different events, but they were in a lot of different events, I think in the neighborhood of uh, 11 or 12. So it was definitely a little bit of a rough summer, but I talked about kind of just trying to stay grounded, stay present, stay grateful. And uh, that mindset definitely helped for a while. Now, going into this next tournament, the Monster Stack, I feel that particularly on day one, I did not play the best. Uh, spoiler alert, I did manage to bag in this event. And for those of you guys who were railing me on social media during that, thank you so much again. It was really appreciated. Uh, really helped me kind of stay grounded in the reality of my situation, not get too kind of caught up in the moment in either direction, um, getting upset about results or honestly getting too excited about how things were going at certain points. Now, with that being said, I still had a kind of busy end of the summer and the days that I did have off, I really needed off. Like I needed them legitimately to be days where I wasn't really doing a lot. And so this is kind of my first chance to sit down, actually record. As you can see, I'm back home. And I figured that uh, you guys would probably appreciate just going over some hands at this point. You've, you've seen some Vegas. Uh, you've seen kind of the travel. There's kind of no need to rehash most of that. I'll probably put a little bit more in another video just because I have a decent amount of Vegas footage and I won't really get to use it in other spots. But uh, I did want to just try some hands this video and get you guys caught up on the monster stack. Now, when I say that my mindset was really only controlled so much, uh, I'm kind of pointing to the fact that I was actually very happy with my play over the course of those 15 bullets where I did not really cash and didn't make it a two. And for the most part, didn't even really make it deep into day ones. But I felt I was playing very well, which is certainly tough. To do i think that historically that has been one of my weakest points is kind of falling apart when things are going poorly and actually needing a longer break to really reset so i was just proud of how i'd been playing but at a certain point you know you're still going to have those moments where things kind of fall apart a little bit so there were some moments like that in the monster stack for sure now, with all that foreshadowing out of the way, let's actually get into the hands. I definitely had kind of mixed feelings about taking notes in the monster stack. I started out wanting to take notes of every hand, being kind of, you know, into it and being excited about it. But then I was playing a lot of hands and I didn't really feel like taking notes on all of them. So I kind of just ended up taking notes on more of the big hands where something interesting happened. Uh, rather than the interesting spots from a strategy perspective, but there's a little bit of a mix. So so we're already a little ways into the tournament here. I am sitting on about 18k, which is pretty much just a hair above starting stack of 15k. And the blinds are 15300 with a 50 ante. No big blind ante in this one. The cutoff has 7,000 to start this hand and opens to 750. I'm in the small blind with ace four of spades, and I think I have a few options here. Three betting would certainly be kind of a standard way to play this hand, although at this stack depth, I didn't really love doing that because most three bets will kind of commit me to calling off here. And I didn't really want to do that for that amount of my own stack. I also think that this hand plays well enough post and the big blind's going to not squeeze as often as he quote unquote should. So I decide to just call here. We end up going heads up. The flop comes 8-4-3 with two spades. So I flop about as well as I can expect to and have a pretty huge combo draw here. I check the cutoff bets and because of his sizing and the stacks behind and the fact that I have equity even against his calling range. In fact, I'm probably a slight favorite against his overall calling range. Um, and I'll get a lot of folds here from better hands like just better ace highs. I go all in. Man, that was kind of a run on sends, but, you know, basically he's going to fold a lot. When he doesn't fold, I'm fine. I'm in good shape. 
So he bets 1300 I jam, and he makes a call with ace-8 offsuit, no spade. The turn is the queen of clubs, and the river is the jack of diamonds. So no luck here, uh, get knocked down quite a peg in a pretty high variance spot, but I don't really mind how I played it, just kind of the way it goes sometimes. In this hand, we're at the 200-400 level with a 50 ante, and somehow I'm up to 36k, which I assume means that I doubled. I really don't remember what happened, and like I said, I wasn't taking a ton of notes on hands. But in any case, there's one limper. I'm in middle position with 9-8 of clubs, and I'm going to bump it up here. I make it 1200. The cutoff calls and the small blind, who I consider to be a pretty solid player, actually bumps it up to 3600. I call because we have such a playable hand, and I end up going heads up to the flop with the small blind. The flop comes 10 7 3 rainbow. He continues for 2500, and I make the call. I could raise here, but it doesn't really seem necessary to me, and I'm never getting him off of over pairs with just a raise here. Don't really want to be forced into a weird barrel spot, so I think just calling is fine. Um, I'm certainly going to have other hands that want to call here and slow play as well, like pocket 10s, pocket 7s, probably pocket 3s as well. So it seems fine to just call here. The turn comes the 9 of diamonds, which is the second diamond on board. He now bets 5,500, and this is a very, very tricky spot because now I do have a pair, so I am beating his ace highs but he would certainly value bet over pairs twice. I actually have more outs if I'm behind to most of those over pairs, so it seems like putting in a raise now could make sense, but I'm at a point in the hand where I'm committing a pretty big portion of my stack if I do that, and I didn't really feel confident that that was the right play. Wasn't sure how much air he would have at this point. But I also didn't really feel I could fold now with those additional outs, so I make the call. You can see how this hand is already starting to get a little bit, you know, shady here where I've got a lot of think he might do this, not sure what he'd do, not sure how I want to play it. And that's really how it was in the moment too. I was very on the fence, didn't feel clear headed about what I wanted to accomplish. The river is a 10 of spades, which is off suit, prepares the top card on the board. And at least from a range perception standpoint, I felt like this card looked a lot better for me than for him. However, he kept betting. He bet 7,500, and I was just trying to put together the pieces here. I felt that this was such a bad card for him and such a good card for my range that it was unlikely he would actually value bet just over pairs at this point. I also didn't think he would have a lot of 10x here that he would bet flop and turn with. And then on top of that, there's still plenty of bluffs available to him that I think makes sense uh, to get me off of the weird stuff that just wouldn't go away, like pocket eights, maybe pocket sixes. That being said, uh, I kind of have to give him a little more credit for being able to value bet thinner probably, because I did end up calling and he had pocket jacks, which was a hand I did not think he was going to bet. Based on my thought process at the time, it's the right call but I'm not sure that I used kind of the right level of reasoning to get to that point. So he's going to take down this big pot, and I am knocked back down a couple of pegs here. The roller coaster continues. Next hand is at 250,500 with 75 ante, and I've got about 22,000. Under the gun raises to 1,100, and I'm in the first middle position with black pocket 10s. I bump it up to 3,200. Middle position 2 calls, and... This is already a little bit concerning, I guess. Under the gun calls as well, and the flop comes 8-6-3 with two diamonds. I see bet 4,500, middle position 2 just folds, and under the gun now makes it 12,500, which is pretty much a committing raise. I don't think there's any hand he does this with that he doesn't get the money in with, which is rather unfortunate. I felt like I was in a pretty tough spot because I thought this player was pretty capable of pretty much calling pre with kind of deceptively strong hands and definitely also has every set available to him so it was sort of a tough spot i also wasn't sure how many combo draws he would have here and the combo draws all perform very well against me many of them will be two overs and a flush draw many of them will be ace high flush draws so at the end of the day i just ended up folding um i'm not really convinced it's right i think that he probably has enough flush draws that we're just forced to 
take a little bit of a flip here, but I did fold in game. Later on, he told me that he had ace four of diamonds. So flush draw, over card, both live, and a plethora of backdoor straight draws. So definitely gets one over on me here, but you never know. You never know what might have come. And I'm not saying that's a reason to fold incorrectly, but with the run that I ended up having, I certainly, I can't really question every decision so hard. This next hand is at 300, 600 with a 100 ante. I've got about 14,500 to start this hand. I have pocket jacks and I open to 2,000. This hand is small blind versus big blind and the big blind is actually Barry Shulman. So very experienced player. I think he owns Card Player Magazine. Uh, and yeah, just kind of an all around crusher. Somehow he's on my left and has been for the last few hours. We've definitely tangled a decent bit and he's been calling me a lot pre. Like, I think he thinks I'm a fish. I might be the fish here. Anyway, Barry calls in the big blind and the flop comes 4-3 deuce to town. I decide to do something kind of weird and check, basically thinking he might stab pretty often and my hand is so strong that playing it deceptively like this, at least sometimes, will kind of throw him off a little bit. He ends up checking it back though and I actually end up turning a set. The turns the jack of spades and I now have an even stronger hand and a hand he can never really put me on. So I decided to bet here and Barry raises. His raise is pretty much committing so I just stick all the money in. It's about 14,500. Barry calls with the queen 10 of clubs which surprised me a little bit because that was the sort of hand I thought he would just stab the flop with and I would have happily gotten a lot more big blinds in before I even had a set. But he ends up calling it off and I end up holding on a river nine to double. So very fortunate spot there. I think it would have played out similarly had we bet the flop anyway, but just goes to show you how sometimes playing these hands sort of weird can occasionally pay off. In these last couple hands, there's not a lot to talk about, but kind of have to talk about them because that's how tournaments work. We're still in the same blind level, which is the last level of the night, and I have about 30k right now. Under the Gun, who is new to the table, jams 6k, and I'm in the small blind with pocket 10s, and I just rejam. Big blind folds, Under the Gun has ace-jack offsuit, and flops an ace on a6-3, brick, brick. Now... Not much to really say there, but it's important to note that if I had won this hand, it's a more than 12k swing in chips, which at this point is 20 blinds, uh, which is substantial. You know, we're at the stage of the tournament where that's kind of a lot of bigs. So third to last hand of the night, and I don't know the details. I don't know the number of big blinds. I know it was bad. You don't need to tell me it was bad, but feel free. Uh, I ended up opening pocket eights in late position, and Barry Shulman on my left ended up three bet jamming a, a lot of bigs. It was probably around 25 or 30 big blinds, and I was tired. It was late. I couldn't figure out what he was doing it with, why he would do it, and um, that's pretty much why he did it, I think, uh, because I ended up calling it off. He had pocket kings, and I just hit an eight. Uh, I can't even tell you if it came on flop, turn, or river. I can't tell you how many bigs the hand was. Uh, I can't even remember how much I bagged. Um, I want to say I bagged about 40 big blinds for day two, but you can kind of see from how my notes were going on in this tournament and just sort of um, the fact that I didn't really know everything that was going on that it's been a sort of rough summer and you you can only avoid so much of this i think and and part of part of being a good player and part of being able to be successful in a series like the world series is being able to then bounce back from things like this and head into day two strong despite some day one failures and some day one mistakes so with that in mind i was excited to finally bag up for the first time although i was pretty sheepish about how i did it given i had to get pretty lucky more than once in this tournament to even just stay alive and to bag a kind of decent chip sack for day two. But I was determined to come back, reset, and play better on day two. 
and I actually think that I did. Probably plan to do another video like this, less of the Vegas scenery, uh, less of the other stuff, more of the hands, but let me know what you guys think about this video. Leave a thumbs up if you liked it and subscribe. Share this video with your friends and leave me a comment letting me know what you thought. There are way more hands to come in the next videos, so stay tuned for that and I'll see you then.